losing time, I'm fading fast I just wanna make it last Try to let go of the past I close my eyes, embrace the blast Sleepless nights and headaches stack Restlessness to hell and back What's my purpose, what do I grab? A slippery surface, a heart attack And sometimes you just gotta believe There's something that'll give you relief There's something that'll have what you need what you need we're broken it's tragic we're not all elastic so as you can see the views changed and like look this is a macbook um like quick time player camera why is it so shitty and my iphone is pretty good i don't know someone help me tell me what to do but um I'm just going to continue on this way, even though it, like, changes the view and everything, but, um, where was I? Oh, by the way, my makeup's ridiculous. Like, I cannot do a liner, like, it, do, like, a nice wing. Every time I do it, it goes bigger and bigger and bigger. One day I'll figure it out. But anyway, um, I think I was in the middle of saying that, um, <clears throat> and it's not like me just assuming this about the guy. Uh, he told me himself that that was a factor like that, you know, there was a chance that his family would like disown him and I didn't want that to happen. We were just kind of figuring it out. Um, like, it seemed like he was probably very torn, but he was still there for me. Like, we would talk and we'd have, like, three-hour conversations. And, um, there was something more than that, too. We, um... I'm not, if I say anything more, I don't want to make this person feel uncomfortable or anything, but all I'll say is that they weren't actually even living in the, where I had my trip that weekend where we met either. So, um, <clears throat> so there's like that factor too. It's like, we're not near each other. We're not. And, um. He's a very honest person. I know some people could will say, oh, we probably just made that up or something, but no, um, because, uh, so we, I don't know what week it was into it. Well, I know what week I had a miscarriage, but, um, that. I don't exactly remember how many weeks it was that we were talking though, but, um, we decide to make a plan to meet up because, you know, he's living in one place, I'm living in another. So we we're going to meet and that week I'm like, you know, preparing, getting, getting ready to go meet him. And I guess I just put too much on my plate between work and that and whatever. I mean, I don't want to blame myself because miscarriages happen all the time and they are normal and natural but I didn't know that at the time so I'm still blaming myself somewhat but on the way to meet him I had a miss not that day but the day before and it was like Christmas day I had like a miscarriage and I mean, it, even though it was, like, very early on, I still was, like, attached because I thought with or without him in my life, like, not attached to him, just attached to the fact that I was pregnant. I, with or without him supporting me or anything or us, I just decided this is what I wanted and I was happy about it and, um... I like even started sharing 
you know, telling people in my life a little bit too early. I can't remember now if I was like nine weeks or it's not that much but then when you really break it down with time just does fly and it even though it was very early on it still hurt a lot like it obviously hurt a lot enough to put me like just over the edge at that point because that's when I really broke down like so things weren't going well at work and in my relationships and feeling alone, isolated, and then what was happening with my cats and everything. And then now this, it was like, wow, I just felt like, what did I do to deserve this? Like, I've already been through so much in my life, like nothing that I want will ever happen. And... And then I didn't know, you know, what we know today. Like, no one really talked about miscarriages much, that how common they were and and everything. They still hurt. It doesn't matter how common it is. Um, but it just, you know, it's just the timing of everything, too. Like, Christmas Day and then, not that I'm super ultra-religious or anything, but it's just a time now that's, like, a little bit... Not ruined but time that I'll always remember and then it's like my birthdays within like the same week practically I'm born on New Year's Eve so uh, it was just really sad but when I look back on it now I'm also very thankful maybe that it happened because well for not only getting me started with getting help with everything but um I like I felt r relief for him as well like the 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 guy because like you know now there were no more ultimatums or anything like that or like any kind of there wasn't gonna be any sort of like backlash or anything and after that happened like he was really nice such a really great guy like he we stayed in touch and we were still talking and then I think we just kind of decided that well we live on opposite sides of the country and <laughs> not even in the same country and all this other like there's just too many factors and then we had this thing and you know like the um the trip that we made was like very costly for both of us too like which is another thing that sucks so um but um anyway but he was really nice like we stayed in touch after and we kind of were still talking but then I can think we just both kind of came to the conclusion that this maybe isn't meant to be and it would just be really like too difficult to and maybe we just didn't think the connection was there either I don't really know but I personally felt okay with it that if we just maybe didn't continue on a relationship and then he I think he was okay with that so <laughs> yeah but um Not really, like, so at this point in time, after this happens, I just felt really, like, maybe even too, just even though I was only just pregnant, like, not even very far into it, but with the hormones, your hormones do change in the beginning. And so with that and everything else and work, and I just made like the rash decision to like rehome my cats first I'm pretty sure that happened because like I said about like not leaving my room and just thinking they deserve better and I don't know I was thinking a lot too about um suicide and 
I never came up with like some concrete plan, but it's like I, from morning to night, like I was thinking about ways that I could do it that wouldn't be so painful and, and I just wanted the pain to stop, but I really, I don't think I wanted to really die. It's just. I just felt really in a dark place and um, it just felt like, yeah, like I said before, just nothing in my life was ever going to be okay. And well, when I rehomed my cats, thinking that was like a good choice for them, that just like <laughs> more than the miscarriage or anything else in my life like fibromyalgia work, nothing was as devastating as rehoming them. Like I just called and found out that like there were next to no cats in the shelters at this time this year. And, and like they were adopted right away, but once that happened, um, I think like at least for a week or something, I was kind of just like, yeah, within this week of this happening and rehoming them, having this miscarriage, quitting, rehoming them, then I, um, I, uh, I don't know what happened first, but on our birthday, like New Year's Eve, me and my friend are out and I'm just really not in a good headspace. And then I took this like edible, I took way too much than I should have had and it just made me really freaking weird. And then I just, I just, I don't know what I was like, but I, I don't know, but my friend said something really horrible to me that like I'll never be able to forget, but she's just like, kind of like, I knew you would do this. Like imagine saying that to someone at like the lowest point in their freaking life. And I was just like sitting at this table with these people I didn't know and I was just really in my head and maybe I said some weird things or whatever but I was like seriously at like the lowest point of my life trying to act like everything's okay and this friend of mine could have just at least encouraged me not to go out that day or something but instead because I reacted in a weird way like they said that and that's just like really horrible but anyway so after that happened um I finally oh Whew, where are we in this? um so 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 I uh so that happened on my birthday <laughs> and I think I like checked myself into a hospital because I just felt like really like so low like how all this had happened to me and then how my friend treated me on my birthday it just like felt like at my low one of my lowest points and I just um checked myself in a hospital just admitting to them that like I was having I felt suicidal and I swear I don't know if this happened on this very night or it's kind of a blur a little bit but it, I'm pretty sure I went at least once or twice and the first time they're like do you have a plan and it's like no and then they kind of just send you on your way like are you freaking kidding me because I didn't say I'm going to do this specific action. Then you just send people out of the hospital. But I can't completely criticize. Because 
like I said, it is a blur, but um, they did get me in touch with like free weekly therapy, at least like out of hospital. So I think I personally probably needed like to be in treatment at that point in my life with everything that had happened. But um, that was the very beginning of getting help for anything. So I got into this STAT program where it's like out of outpatient treatment once a week and so because see again I don't remember if it's before or after but I took this edible like a way too much like a full portion I didn't know anything about marijuana edibles at that time like I didn't know how what especially if you're not doing it every day and you have like a low tolerance like I took a whole thing and I made myself a bath and I took this edible and I thought that that was just gonna like make everything better with like make me feel better when I'm feeling so bad about not having my cats and having the miscarriage and everything I just took this edible and I had a bath and I got in and it's like the edible already makes your heart race I'm pretty sure and but the bath like the hot water like I didn't know at the time that's obviously what was happening but I just thought I was dying and I just started wailing I hadn't cried like really cried in like almost the entire time all of this was happening I hadn't really like let it out and oh yeah so that's when I went to the hospital I think that was the second or first time I don't remember but then I got the outpatient treatment and um Hmm. I'm mixing up the story a bit because I, I do remember, I think, I was actually talking to this lady before the miscarriage. So I think I already kind of had a hospital visit where I was like admitting to feeling like really low and suicidal and then, and then going on this trip getting pregnant thinking like oh maybe it's like the answer to all my problems not like I went purposely it happened it just did happen and then I'm still talking to this lady and then I um but <clears throat> it was it was helpful like and not at the same time I don't know it was just reliving details and it was kind of like they just they decided that I like had BPD and um, at the time like I read like the 12 or whatever reasons why it said and I just have to do something quick Anyway, at the time with all the things that I was experiencing right in that moment, I thought, okay, well, this does sound like me, like, a but, um, now knowing what I know about myself, like those early years and drinking and stuff like that it isn't me. Like that is just being young and what was going on at the time and it's like so complex I barely even said anything I'm just telling you this like one little part of my life and but now what I know today is that it a lot of autistic women tend to get misdiagnosed with BPD because when I look at that list now it's like even like with suicidal for example like BPD people do tend to admit that they it is one of the things where you kind of like use and I'm sorry to say this I'm not trying to say this in a judgmental way but they kind of 
make threats about doing that kind of like to keep relationships and things but that wasn't something maybe I'm wrong about this and I'm sorry if I really offend someone I don't want to do that um there's just a lot to the list that's not like me at all actually and like I'm not so, so much of a risk taker and I'm not like um Like, that's one thing I was just wondering about. It's like, do, like, impulses and things. Like, those are things I all happened under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Like, not me as a human. Like, do they ever take that into account when they give people BPD diagnosis? I just don't know. But I remember specifically some psychiatrists asking me about special interests because I'm sure that they suspected that I'm autistic and I kept going like I've said before I'm just like no because I just had lo low self-esteem I didn't know that what that even really meant I thought special interests were like the people I've known in my life who were just like really good in school or athletes and I didn't like I've had a lot of special interests <laughs> like I said about collections and astrology and and pretty much anything I find really interesting the moment I could read like I could read something and recite it to you if I'm really really into it and I have a pretty bad memory so but if like, I could talk your ear off about something that I've just read if I really find it fascinating for probably, like, a long time. <laughs> but I have a bad memory, so I don't do that about everything. Like, some autistic people have great memories and they can talk for to you for an hour about a certain subject, and I can't exactly do that. I could have before, probably with astrology, <laughs> but, um, anyway, so, yeah, doc, so with BPD, maybe I should pull it up and, like, go through a list, like, what, and how, so I could explain to you why I just know that isn't. distorted self-image I mean yes but I also struggled with my weight and I also um lost a lot of weight at some point where it like really just made me have loose skin and stretch marks and cellulite and everything at such a young age so is it distorted self-image or is it just practical self-image mood swings I tend to be like a really kind person to everybody but if there really has to be a reason like I don't think I'm just like if somebody's like hurt my feelings or something but I'm not like really like a mood swing person where I'm like just like thankfully I'm sorry for the people I guess like I could change on a dime if like Maybe, for example, what I know now and I didn't know before, but like having CPTSD, like something could definitely change my mood on a dime. And unstable relationships. Yes, of course, as an autistic person, my whole life that's been a struggle and someone with CPTSD. Fear of an abandonment. I did think that all the time, but I never... For example, like what I was trying to say about, I never told somebody like, I'm going to end my life if they leave me or something like that. And I'm sorry that does happen to people and it's not like your fault if you do say those things, but I, that's just something I never did. And 
the suicidal stuff I really kept to myself and the only people that ever really knew about it was when I first got help with so with the doctor and the counselor and impulsive well that's a video for another day like I'm definitely I am somewhat impulsive but I'm also just an addict I've really come to terms with like so when I'm not drinking, I'm overeating. When I'm not overeating, I'm, I started like going and getting like Popeye supplements all the time. Like all this, every single day, practically like a coffee and some sort of like sh bar full of crap food, like trading being fat for chemicals, basically. <laughs> and then if I'm not doing that, it's like shopaholic or just and then I was gambling at times too and or drinking excessively like when I'm not eating very much then I'm doing that and it's just something I've really acknowledged lately I kind of have been saying this for a while like an, an addictive personality and then I would backtrack and say things like well I've never relied on alcohol like day in day out but now knowing this about myself is really helpful that I am an addictive person to everything that I find really interesting or um if I find interesting or it's like my new obsession or whatever <coughs> but um knowing this about myself will hopefully help me because now if a problem does arise in the future whether it be alcohol or drugs or like, hopefully that will never happen, and hopefully knowing this about myself is, like, one of those steps to prevent that, but I'm just trying to say that, um, like, before I kind of used to make excuses about things, or I'd say, like, well, I'm not drink. I don't, I could go a long time without drinking, but then I abuse alcohol really heavily when I was out dancing with my friends or something, like, it's just really complicated because like that could just seem like a normal thing you do in your 20s but um but yeah impulsive somewhat goes hand in hand with my addiction addictive personality self-injury so aside from that one post I did share about my first and only attempt that was my first and only attempt so self-injury I mean, it depends how you can look at it. Like, if you are being impulsive and you're being, and you're being promiscuous or experimenting with drugs or binge eating, is that self-injury? I don't know. I, I'm looking at it, like, solely as a suicide attempt thing, and that's not. So, a lot of these I actually do. You know, like risky behavior, yes, back then. Feeling of emptiness, yes. Then and now, as like an isolated CPTSD autistic person, a lot of this list just does go hand in hand with suicidal threats. So no, not threatening people to try to get them to stay in my life or something. That thankfully has never been something I did suspicious yes like paranoid or when I was under the influence of marijuana like I said that story about my friend saying you have paranoid personality disorder again don't diagnose your friends folks especially when you don't know everything and you're not a doctor but um any inappropriate anger well I think as a person with CPTSD who saw real mood swings and anger day in, day out for the first 18 years of my life, like, I did find that people kind of thought my reactions to things were, like, angry or, like, but also, like, as an autistic person, like, for example, like, say there's plans that are made and I'm, like, thinking, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm thinking about the time and I'm thinking about what I'm going to wear and then I 
put all this effort in and then say plans get cancelled like I do have meltdowns like a lot less these days but I used to have like meltdowns and aut autistic meltdowns and I didn't know that was the word for it so that goes also with inappropriate anger so this list it does seem a lot like autism actually and it makes me wonder sometimes it's like what is the reason for doctors to diagnose people with BPD over autism like why do why is it so easy for this psychiatrist to say you have BPD but then in order to get diagnosed with autism we have to go see a psych psychologist for and that psychiatrist will meet you one time for one hour and then they'll say BPD <laughs> but I've met with a psychologist who did like a thorough examination of my entire life for hours and hours and hours over the span of weeks and weeks and then I did the actual autistic tests and stuff too where it's like okay it is official <laughs> but it just makes you wonder because like BPD has always been like very stigmatized and it's almost like a blame thing. It's like you're, it's just really ugly. And then if you're autistic, it's like now it's a lot more accepted and it's, it just does make me wonder why. And then you have to pay for it. Like how fair is that? Like there's something like it was hard for me to tell them in that moment. Like when I'm talking now, it's kind of just like, these are my thoughts. But when I'm sitting with a professional and they're asking me about my past and then I'm talking about trauma and then they're asking me about special interests, like my mind completely has shut down. Like I could almost barely get the words out to you. I could barely even tell you about the trauma. I could, it's, so how I communicate here in these videos is not how I can communicate when I'm like sitting down with a professional. Maybe now, yes, at 34 years old, but earlier on or, you know, when I was a kid, absolutely not. Like I've come a huge way in terms of communication and knowing more about ourselves and knowing about myself helps with this but um see look I got on a tangent about BPD when this video is supposed to be well it is part of it like this is um this is all part of the beginning stages of getting help um because, like, okay, say someone from my past sees this and they're like, you know what, I don't think you're autistic. I think you just have BPD and CPTSD. Well, like, none of that in there in the description about BPD said anything specific about struggling with, like, job, employment, and and in school and having like learning disabilities and things like that which I do have it's like I was not diagnosed with dyslexia when I do have a form of dys like some range of dyslexia like I said in my other videos about like reading the numbers back or when I'm writing putting letters in front of each other and that um and having trouble hearing like words and songs like it's just like muffled I can only hear like certain parts of songs almost every single song I know very few songs beginning to end um just a lot of different challenges that have nothing to do with BPD so that's why I just want to keep saying that but some people from my past might see this and say, oh, it does sound like you have autism, or we always kind of thought maybe that was that. But another thing too, I shouldn't freaking care. 
what anyone has to say or think about it. And I am just assuming, like, it's possible that, like, no one from my past will see this. And I hope so. <laughs> I had, like, a lot of... I had, like, teachers that weren't even nice to me either. Like, did they know I was autistic? Did they know I was being extremely abused at home? Maybe not, but there, there's some teachers that it's like, what are you doing here? <laughs> there's some teachers that are just meant to be teachers and there's some teachers it's like why do you it just makes me wonder like were you ostracized when you were a kid and then now you enjoy being a bully or what like you enjoy chiming in with the others who don't like this kid and you want to be cool or what is it like so one teacher really stands out in my mind there weren't really that many there were a lot of nice ones but this one teacher just really hated me but um anyway back to this <laughs> back to this traumatic list um so where was I I guess I was saying that I was like getting help and for the first time so so I also, during that time, made, like, the rash decision to move. I just kind of decided, like, I'm still in my late 20s. I still want to be able to have, like, Victoria is more of, like, a slow-paced, like, retirement type of community with, like, three Walmarts and one superstore. And, like, it's still awesome. Like, there's tons to do here. Like, I really do love it now. It's just that... At the time, I thought Vancouver's where I should really be. It's like my last chance to kind of live somewhere where it's like more of, you know, more music, more nightlife, more meeting people, maybe with similar interests and everything. And so I moved there. I think I want to save that for another day. Well... I'm just going to say that moving to this home in Vancouver put me like in a really dangerous situation because I was living with people who were really like I had to call the cops to like help someone and um, and that just so I was living in a new place I was at this horrible job my fibromyalgia is at its absolute worst I have a miscarriage I rehome my cats I quit my job I move and then I live in this place where it's like it kind of was just like the world telling me like okay it's time to give up like <laughs> it was just really bad I was living in this place where you know like even for example one of the kid one of the students studying was kind of friendly with me and she came into my room one time and she saw the BPD book and she went <gasps> like she like, it's such a horrible feeling when you're first trying to figure out stuff about yourself. You're first getting help for childhood trauma and then someone has the nerve to, like, bounce back like you're just such a monster. But, um, anyway, and, and with calling the police, that put me in... A bad position because it's really hard to explain without saying any details and I'm going to try my best not to say the details but let's just say there was like a an argument we'll just say and that person gets taken away but the other person's living in the home and then that person stays with that person, that abusive person. And then the tables are turned onto me, like being this problem. Like, meanwhile, this other person thanked me for calling and stuff. But anyway, it just put me in a really bad situation. Like, they just tried, like, turning the whole house against me for some reason. And and I was already like literally at the lowest point in my life and it just, it really just does bother me to this day about that. And 
And then something even more crazy happened in all of this. Um, so by February, so I moved there to Vancouver area about, um, I don't know if it was January or February 1st. Yeah, I wasn't there for very long. February, and then my grandma passed away. My grandma, who was living in Victoria with my two aunts, she passed away suddenly. I mean, she kind of knew her health wasn't very good, and she was becoming, like, having dementia, where she was, like, yeah, she's just in the early stages or middle stages of that. And so she passed away and, and I'm living in this dangerous place and I'm on edge and I'm on welfare and I'm like going to food banks to eat, to, like to get food. And I'm living on like rice and beans and mayonnaise, like pretty much that was my only meal. I dropped like 20, 30 pounds in like one month and not intentionally. I was just literally starving and I wasn't even that big back then. I was still big by society standards, but I was like around my normal and I just dropped like, and then, uh, my cat's playing with something. And then, um, Literally a month to the day is when my dad's health declined and we got there back to Winnipeg and and I've always kind of thought this that in some strange way like him I just didn't feel like the way they have it set up with welfare is like you can't just get uh, help help from like your family and stuff like they can't just send you money to get food and extra things if you don't have enough with whatever they give you is whatever they give you and anything extra you get they're gonna deduct from what they give you so I just felt really trapped I wasn't back at work yet I'm in the lowest p point of my life mentally and I'm living in this house and then and then she dies and then a month later my dad dies and it just feels like in some way oh I'm running out of room I have to keep this very brief but I'm pretty much there I think I was just trying to say that in some bizarre way like my dad dying like saved my life because I was just in this dangerous situation in this home and I felt like I had no way out and I'm at this lowest point in my life and um and like maybe I could have been asking for more help but like I said um when you're on like welfare you can't really be request making like special requests like I couldn't just pack up and move I didn't have like a deposit I didn't who knows how long that would have t taken and everything's just was really bad and I don't want to say too much about what was like actually going on in there but it's just that someone was living in the house that sh wasn't even on the on any sort of agreement and um, and things were just not good there and I just felt really unsafe like whether they were actually gonna harm me or not like everything I had gone through in life and then in this like short time frame I just felt like it did it like must have done damage to my heart like I just felt this pressure like day in day out morning to night and I was like hardly getting anything to eat like it was just I couldn't even go to the kitchen the shared space like I just felt so it was just really not good and um and then when my dad died I got like the flight back to Winnipeg so 
It just feels like somehow it like him passing like saved my life. And I know that's like a weird way to look at it, but I think I have heard other people say they've had like experiences like that where it's not like a sacrifice or something. It's just this, I don't know what, but weird phenomenon. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and that just led to the whole next chapter of my life, which, you know, there's a lot of good, but, um, I'll have to get into it in a different video, but, like, there's a lot of good that came from this horrible period in my life like just getting help and then participating in different programs and and then starting my own home daycare for four years I just can't believe four years it was just um like I said before like so awesome so healing and some of those kids were were, were with me from like you know, like, pretty much when I opened the door to, like, having to go to kindergarten or, um, you know, like, a lot of them stayed with me for years and, um, and things just really kind of just took a turn with that when I went with COVID, which I know it screws up a lot of people's it screwed up a lot of lives but um with me it just kind of like I was finally at this place where I was like financially in a good position I'm at this career I absolutely love and it like felt like I'm meant for and then the pandemic and and then moving into the country it's just like a whole series of new mistakes and stuff but um this point um what the hell? Go, go away. <sighs> anyway, um, it's kind of just funny how it's like my whole he healing journey wasn't over. Like I was still, I guess, back into. I dealt with things for a little period in time then I just went right back into work where sometimes I was working like 10 12 hour days and I was still and then I'm like focused on them and making sure the kids happiness is first and I was always like giving back with gifts and things I just d sh didn't need to be doing like to put myself in a bad situation financially and 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 then but it's kind of like just in this way, like the journey of self-acceptance, self-discovery and everything was not over. Like the second part, part needed to happen, I guess, to get me to where I am now, where I finally, like despite how I, what I'm saying and how I sound or how I seem, like I finally feel like I'm starting to get back to a really good place. Like when I relive my trauma and I'm telling you guys all kinds of things and I'm, I made a poem and all of this is like, it does seem like I'm probably not in a good place, but it's just to like spread awareness and it is uncomfortable talking about these things. I just want, don't want to pretend like I'm not going to come in here and mask and be, try to be sharp and have a script and like, just be really engaging. I'm just being a hundred percent authentic <laughs> and it just feels good for like the first time in my life, like being able to be completely honest about things in the past and where I am now and my cat's in the litter box. <laughs> anyway, I am looking forward to this next part of my life. Like, even though I did say like 
when I was writing my book in the last video I made, I said that it kind of just does feel like my hopes and dreams are dead about like having a family, getting married, all of that stuff. But maybe my life is just not meant to be ordinary. It's not meant to be the white picket fence and it's, I have a different purpose in life and that's another video. I have to make a video about things I've done in my life, like different jobs I've had, different schooling, like massage therapy, dental assisting. I actually finished dental assisting and the massage therapy kind of got derailed with the whole fibromyalgia thing, but that's another video for another day. That was like really fun. I enjoyed that a lot. But I was like working full time and in school full time for this like really heavy course load, which was like, I loved every bit of it, but I just really bombed uh, anatomy. <laughs> I passed physiology, I passed everything else, but some part along the way, I just had to like give up on anatomy. Like I was going to have to redo that. <laughs> it was just way... Like, knowing the origin insertion of every single muscle in the body and everything like that. Like, my, I just couldn't do it. And it turns out I wasn't going to be a massage therapist anyway. Like, that's around the exact time where I started getting um, tests done for my, like, I don't even know what side of my scar is. <laughs> right here. Um, I got this mole removed and that's, like, how the whole beginning of getting diagnosed with fibromyalgia began so again another video for another day because it's a very long just like everything else but um the reason I'm doing this isn't just to be like hear me and hear my story but I just know there's a lot of us who struggle in every single way that I'm describing like whether it be being diagnosed late in life with autism or struggling in all these different avenues or growing up in a really unstable and healthy toxic environment or you know not getting help for their mental health for just fear of being judged or feeling different and then you know, and then just finally getting to a point in life where you're like, okay, this is what, this is, and this is what it is, and it's fine. Like, it's okay to be who you are. Like, none of this is your fault. Like, have you, have you made mistakes in your life? Yes, you have, but, and many, and you're going to make many more, but having CPTSD is not your fault and having autism is not your fault and it just feels just feels really good and learning more about ourselves helps us tremendously and and finally getting diagnosed and finally being like A person's a person with disability in Canada it just feels good knowing that I don't have to jump through freaking hoops if something bad happens in the future like it is it easy to live off of like fourteen hundred dollars a month no it is like literally impossible but you're allowed to earn a certain amount per year and um, I am gonna get back to work and I might even be full-time in the near future and I might be off disability but it is good knowing that it's there that if something bad happens like I don't have to jump through hoops again to relive my trauma and tell and try to beg and plead because when you're just on regular assistance you get like under a thousand dollars a month to live off of like if you're living with home you're living with your parents and you're not contributing in any way then that's one thing but it's impossible like if you have your own place your own vehicle you have pets you have yourself like if I hadn't had help 
at times, like, I would have been homeless. And, and really, like, it always just feels like that is a possibility. Like, it's always, like, kind of just in the back of my mind, like, if anything happened, like, I could be homeless at any given moment. But now that I'm finally in this good place where I have, I'm, like, taking back control of my life in different ways and I have this newfound acceptance of myself and understanding of myself and I feel good and I'm not depressed and I'm being productive and I'm doing these videos and I'm making jewelry and I'm losing weight and I'm just feeling good again. Um, I'm just making sure that like hopefully my future is a little bit more secure. <laughs> and yeah. Anyway, I've been doing this for quite a long time. <laughs> I'm wondering if I'm just going to be putting this into one video or doing part one or part two or I'll figure it out. But thank you so much for listening. And I know that this isn't like all of this heavy stuff and it's not like, like, I don't know. It does make me wonder sometimes like who's going to be listening to this. It's not like, it's not positive. It's not funny. I'm not like giving you all these references I'm not but like I said as cliche and cheesy as it sounds like if it just makes like at least a few people feel good that's like is important to me like because I'm talking about subjects that are not talked about often or are uncomfortable or people avoid and and I'm just going to keep doing it. I'm just going to keep ex telling you different aspects of what people with autism struggle with or different hurdles and fibromyalgia I got to finally get into one day about that whole getting. And I guess like the whole moral of all these videos is just that it's like you just have to be your own advocate like, and you have to try to like none of I wouldn't have been able to accomplish any of this like yes I've had help in some ways but if I hadn't just constantly demanded that you know like just demanding basic human rights essentially <laughs> We all need to just fight for it if we can in, every, in any which way. Because there's just things right now that just aren't right. Like, people say how great Canada is. Well, it is, but there's a lot of ugliness right now. Like, there's, and the way people treat disabled people, like, you think I want to be living off of under a thousand a month and now fourteen hundred a month. You think that that's a choice I'd like to make. You think I'm just a freeloader, like living off the government. I've literally been babysitting since I was 11. I got my first job at 15 and a half. I had to like sign a waiver or some, some sort of form because I started early. I went to college. I finished high school. I've worked this whole time. I had a job career I absolutely loved for four years. Like I'm not, there's a lot of us and it doesn't even matter what anyone's done in their life like what if you're disabled you're disabled and and it can happen to anybody like you're looking down on people you're making fun of people it could happen to your child like they could get in an accident and lose a limb maybe they're all there mentally and they're sharp and they can still work different jobs but you don't think that trauma is going to affect their life in some way or another like I know that it's all on the mindset, but just say there was something where they couldn't work after for a while, like, and say their parents passed away and their friends have all, ha they all have their own lives. They're all in, they're all working, married with kids and you're just alone. 
like and you're left to live off of like $1,400 a month and you're possibly going to lose your home and you're going to lose your license and then that's even more isolating you don't you live in a place that doesn't even have public transportation uh, I could just go on and on it's just um I just really do feel for the people out there who are disabled like we're already facing obstacles that people can't even imagine and then we're battling People who just, people just say ugly things, like, whether it be on TikTok or online, these, like, little internet keyboard warrior trolls. I know eventually, someday, like, I've had very little, I've had, like, no comments or very little, like, interaction. I've had, like, views on my content, but I know someday people are going to say something and it's going to bother me, but I'm just going to try to make the decision to like not feed the trolls like if I have to delete every comment and just not give in to it and not say anything back I'll just do that because sometimes I think we're spending too much time like I don't know trying to combat the trolls when we could just be talking about other things but <laughs> Just don't give them what they want. They want to, like, bring you down and they want to try to make themselves feel better in some way. I mean, if somebody needs to do that to feel better about themselves, I feel sorry for you. Like, truly. And, yeah, so... That's my first... That was a sec like a one little chapter in my book of many chapters from elementary school to middle school, high school and work and relationships and diagnoses and college and you know a million things I have to share but I'm at the point again where I'm like, how do I just end this video? <laughs> Thank you for listening and um, I hope you can just take something away from this and feel better or, you know, even if you're like, say you're watching my videos and I'm talking about like trauma of my childhood and stuff and you're just like well that's not going to be me as a parent or I'm going to not I'm not going to make that mistake like that is good enough <laughs> reason like there's my videos I think are kind of for everybody like whether it be disabled community autistic community fibromyalgia or or just average Joes or people <laughs> people who just don't have a clue what it's really like um and yeah I don't mean to be such a negative Nelly to <laughs> you <laughs> I can't believe I said that um Believe it or not, like, when I'm telling you all these things, that is not really, like, me as a person day in, day out. Like, my my philosophies on life and how I, like, see the world. Like, it's kind of me just telling you stories and it's really hard to hear or uncomfortable or you just don't want to go on and listen. But, um, Uh, believe me, I have a lot of tips and tricks to try to, like, make life really enjoyable and happy. And, like, I do feel like I'm just, that's what's been able to get, keep me going. If I was truly negative, I just don't think I'd be here today. There's no way I'd be able to, 
just survive the things I have if I hadn't ha had some sort of like oh something just came to mind I um I think it was the day I wrote the poem about suicide and and it was pretty late at night and then I was taking my dogs out to walk for their last pee break and I look up at the sky and there's like this flash across the sky almost like it didn't really look like it didn't look like a plane it didn't look like a spaceship or anything it didn't really look like a shooting star or or lightning like it was kind of weird because like a few days before that my friend we were talking about how Victoria doesn't really get like thunderstorms like very rare I hear cat things anyway um so when I saw this flash across the sky right after I wrote that it just it felt like weird like kind of like hmm maybe I do have guardian angels looking out for me after all and it just kind of brought a little bit of peace and comfort knowing that maybe someone even in my family history that I didn't know or know very well like or there were some of those elderly relatives that were really nice, but we just didn't, have, like, we didn't, weren't close. Um, it just makes me think maybe there is someone out there who does care. And maybe we do all have people looking out for us, even when it feels like you don't. Okay, well, thank you so much, and uh, talk to you later.